Greetings, 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 friends. Right, I'm going live in a variety of spaces. Awesome. Um, I have the very great privilege today to uh, be a part of a, a, a webinar where um, I was uh, I had the opportunity to to put some thinking um, towards why are we experiencing the kinds of things that we're experiencing. It's it's a really helpful exercise uh, to have gone through because I actually reviewed. Um, articles and literature coming from um, other disasters and other uh, points of crisis in our, in, in our historical timeline or immediate historical timeline that I would have lived through. So things like 9-11, SARS, Hurricane Katrina, um, Christchurch earthquakes and, and things like that and, and had an opportunity to look at um, both kind of newsy articles as well as more academic articles about what uh, psychologists have put together in terms of the immediate repercussions and also the long-term repercussions. Uh, the reason why I uh, thought that this was a, an important thing to do is because there are kind of different ways to approach um, mental health issues and it's a really helpful thing to actually put frameworks and language around our experiences otherwise we can kind of get lost in a myriad of things to help us to cope right so I want to just share with you um, what I, a little bit of what I shared today, uh, just by way of giving you a sense of uh, containment or even explanation for what you might be experiencing or what you might be seeing others experience, right? So here's the thing. Um, what, what's happening right now, and you're probably sick of hearing about COVID-19, uh, but you know, I really enjoy looking at trends. And so today I actually went on Google Trends just to see what are people searching for. And of course, people are still searching for things all COVID related. Um, there's a fantastic website as well called Answer the Public. It's um, awesome. And you type in a search phrase and it tells you like uh, it does a meta map of like what the, the world is um, asking in relation to a particular topic. And what I found was people are still getting their heads around, you know, the fear factor of COVID. How can I catch it? When will a vaccine be ready? Um, how do we, um, when is this going to end? Um, things like, you know, can COVID-19 live in your hair? Um, but in and amongst all of that uh, is also an emergence of the initial distress reactions that we are seeing in people. Uh, so insomnia, um, children um, not sleeping, children getting anxious and worried. And of course, the, um, though this has not come up as a search, but I've had a look at some lifeline statistics, there is also the immediate distress that is coming from people who are losing their jobs and losing livelihood and losing income. And so the increase of calls to Lifeline, of course, has gone up, right? So what are the closest parallels that we have to understand this? And when I've had a look, I really think that the 2003 uh, experience with SARS is a very interesting one. Um, 2003 into 2004, I was working uh, in, hang on, when was my, oh no, we were here already, but we had an opportunity to be in Asia when another one of these um, health epidemics broke out. So let me cast the picture here for you, right? Human beings, like in our history of, of crisis, have experienced different types of danger and, and traumatic uh, situations. There are natural disasters where something has happened in a particular location that has brought obvious danger, right? So that's natural disaster. Uh, there's acts of terrorism. Uh, so people have actually um, witnessed uh, human beings being cruel to other human beings, right? Um, and, you know, but again, that tends to be in one location. And then there's the illness type uh, crisis um, of which COVID-19 belongs to and SARS does as well, 
where something quite um, unpredictable and uncontrollable comes and we witness what it is, the fear of being able to catch that and also the threat of death. So vulnerability. What makes it different though, is that with regards to acts of terrorism and natural disasters, it's an episode, it's an event, right? Um, the horrible thing happens and by and large, it, it's done. And then we have the aftermath to rebuild or recover um, and, and, and work there out. So there is an acute experience, like a crisis, a critical experience at that point in time. And then we have the ability to, to bring ourselves down to a particular level because the event has happened, number one. Number two is more often than not, and depending on where you're watching this video, um, Australians are really, really blessed. Uh, we weren't so much in this summer, but because we had bushfires, which, you know, it's a natural disaster. But by and large, you know, it, if a natural disaster happens, to a certain extent, we have a, a psychology behind us that knows that, oh, every summer we're going to have to, you know, deal with the bushfires that come through. Or we live in um, a country where earthquakes are an issue and you'd have the drill, right? You, you know as, as a community how to keep yourself safe, even though there's an element of, you know, this could be us, but you've, you've got a narrative to say, this is what we need to do to keep safe. Boom, 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 boom. It's kind of rehearsed, right? Um, you, you, it, it's embedded, like when we were building a house, we had to do all of this uh, applications for to make sure that, that we weren't in a bushfire zone, et cetera. So there's a degree of preparedness as well that comes from that. And a sense of security that if we live in a country where natural disasters tend to happen, um, if we, you know, have been exposed to, to terrorism before, such as 9-11, there are some scripts and some things that we have rehearsed to the best of our ability to keep, keep ourselves safe. And we can kind of predict after what happens. And in both of those instances, whether it's natural disasters or acts of terrorism, they're event based. The thing happens. Sometimes it can go for a bit longer, like we did with the bushfires. It's done and then we rebuild. In a case of an epidemic um, such as SARS, uh, the thing comes with very little preparation. You don't really have a script, right? And in the past, uh, these sorts of illness based crises, again, uh, while not event-based, in other words, there's no timeline for us to predict it, may have been in a geography or a location that was external to us. It's, out, it's somewhere out there. We're watching it with horror, um, but it's out there, unless you were in the country that this happened. Again, depends on where you're watching this, right? With COVID-19, there are elements of all three um, crisis points for human beings experiencing it. There is an element that, especially if you're living in Australia, we've just come out of bushfire season. So we were exhausted anyway um, with the bushfires. And, and you know, there was a, a narrative of, of, of having to rebuild. And, you know, if you can think, if you're living in Australia, you know that part of, and, and this was my thinking, I was going to move my personal retreat and champion any kind of um, occasion that we had to actually go into those bushfire uh, damaged places to see if we can uh, reboost, regenerate morale, but also to pump some financial incentive, um, financial flow back to those communities. We were just in rebuild stage and then boom, COVID-19 hits, right? So there's elements therefore of, uh, it's like a natural disaster because we're, as we're watching industries collapse, jobs collapse, industries com collapse, it's like this flattening of the economy and, um, you know, a displacement of human beings, right? It's, 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 it's dramatic, it, it's tragic, it's horrible. Plus, it's a little bit like acts of terrorism because I don't know about you, but it was incredible, incredibly wounding. To I, I remember the first time I got my hands on the to, on a toilet on a pack of toilet paper. The first time I actually got toilet paper, it was like the most bizarrest thing that I literally believed someone was going to stab me or club me. Right, so I'm holding the toilet paper. I'm I'm hiding it under my arm. I'm opening the car booth. I'm looking here and I'm, I'm shoving it in, right? Because I don't know whether someone's going to come and like 
I don't know, hurt me for my toilet paper. I mean, we were witnessing senseless acts of violence and lack of compassion and empathy, people overriding sensibility. Uh, you know, so we were also witnessing that, right? And then we've also got this, this, uh, uh, the situation with an illness-based crisis that we can't rehearse for this. We don't know how long this is going to go for. So I would suggest that COVID-19 uh, is a unique situation because it is global. It's not something that we can watch from a removed space. It is something that we are living through and, and, and it is global, right? So it's, it's all around us with no time marker. And what has also been robbed of us is our ability to come together. So let's look at SARS. What have I picked up from uh, reviewing, uh, I will call it the narrative of SARS because I wouldn't wanna say that I've researched it by no means. I do not have a PhD in um, upper respiratory infection diseases. So here's what I gathered. When we actually look at the mental health implications of SARS, the impact of quarantine impositions was one of the main aggravators for mental health. And what has been suggested is that when quarantine goes for longer than 10 days, that's probably going to be worse on our mental health, right? So why? Um, boredom, guilt, fear, um, stigmatization as well. If you have been named as someone who's had COVID-19, come in contact with someone with COVID-19 uh, or um, come back from overseas. You know, all the judgy stuff that was going on. Why'd you go overseas? There is stigma um, and people feel leprous in their own community. So that's that's going to stick. Uh, so quarantine, and if you think about what's happening now with us, we're kind of like in a in 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 in, in a, a perpetual lockdown state at this point in time. Um, the second thing is that our health, the healthcare workers. So in in the SARS episode, um, healthcare workers uh, suffered greatly in their mental health. Post traumatic stress disorder, uh, depression, and anxiety um, were were significant. Uh, because you have this situation where healthcare workers, by instinct, um, only human would 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 have safety concerns for themselves and the pos possibility that every time they go to work, they're going to bring back something to their elderly parents or their young children or their neighbours or their community, and yet being compelled to continue to give and serve. So it's a kind of a moral injury as well of of feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm going to work, I'm doing this stuff, but geez, it, 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 geez Louise, it's scary, right? I could bring home the bomb, right? Uh, there's also an element of moral injury in that needing to make decisions about who gets the ventilator, who doesn't, who gets a hospital bed, who doesn't, uh, that, that also happens. Now, what's interesting for all of us and particularly pertinent for our healthcare workers is that our internal sense of community our camaraderie, our safety in ranks has also been dismantled. I certainly feel it in my practice uh, as a group of psychologists where we can't have lunch together. We're, we're, like, we're, we're, you know, we're far away from one another. Uh, we're, we're afraid of coughing. Fear uh, and an unnatural way of connecting has come into our ranks, right? So in the SARS literature, there is this, and I believe it's it's happening now as well, there is this, this sense that the, the halls of the hospitals, rather than ringing with the hope and the purpose of life, is, is, is empty and hollowed out by the fear that we could catch it too, and it's sterile. We're all in, um, you know, in masks and robes. We're having lunch facing away. Um, and there's a sense of death and illness just rings through the halls of which we have to walk, right? So if you actually think about that, the impact on, on our healthcare workers uh, is tremendous, tremendous. Um, young people, children and adolescents. So already we've noticed that uh, children um, and our adolescents are having a hard time sleeping. And we may think that that's got to do with lack of exercise and, and, and screen consumption time. But can I suggest when I've actually looked at the narrative, you know, post uh, SARS and post um, some of these disasters, 
what is it what it is is that children and adolescents have had a very limited exposure to danger outside of you know things that we warn them can happen on the street like be careful about the car or you know be you know you i don't know if you all still say don't talk to strangers but you know sort of that sort of a thing right inappropriate touch and all of that there is nothing in their schematics because the wiggles never talked about it um play school never talked about it to say that danger is bigger than that and now they're all talking about it <laughs> Our play school is saying, oh, we have to wash our hands and stay social, you know, physically distanced. And it's like, what is this for children? Like, I have no like experience of this level of danger. And then I'm looking at my mom and my dad and the doctors and people are walking around in masks. And now I have to wear a mask. So they have a very superficial, rightly so, that is protective for them, experience of hardship and suffering. And now the doors have been opened wide open, the veil has been pulled back, and they're absolutely not only spectating, but living through um, this experience. And so for children because and adolescents, because they don't have then the life experience to fall back and say, oh, well, when that happened, I did this and it was okay. Or, you know, when that happened, um, this person came, helped me, and now I'm okay. So it's like vulnerability and fear is wide open. So for our children and adolescents, their mental health is actually going to be vulnerable, which is probably why um, I probably think it's a helpful thing to say, don't sweat the small stuff with the work and the studies, yeah? Because in a lot of ways, they're going to get back to school and have a regroup experience and will need to process what they've been through um, and then get back onto the sense of, you know, normal learning. It's actually really difficult for children to learn and encode and absorb learning material when their emotions are all over the place and when they're feeling dysregulated and out of routine, right? So, um, so there is that uh, with... So how long can these things last for? Well, when I've been reading through the literature, there's going to be an immediate uh, imprint on our mental health. And then we may have a longer lasting effect of it, you know, three years even down the line, because um, we will basically uh, think about these things every time we get a cough, every time we get a sore throat, um, every time we... Um, I don't know whether I'm still going to have post-traumatic stress when I grab the toilet paper. It's an interesting dynamic that I've been, I have not gone to grab toilet paper now when I've seen it. It's like I almost have to only touch it when I absolutely need it, right? Like there's a whole re re rewriting of scripts. Okay, that's all the bad stuff. I guess I just wanted to give, give us all a sense that if we're feeling the weight of things, it's because COVID-19 falls into a different category of probably us experiencing the level of disruption and trauma and uncertainty uncertainty that comes from um, crisis level events such as natural disasters, right? Okay, so what to do about this? Well, first of all, uh, it's been shown that actually being able to engage in, um, in social connections is really, really important. And I don't mean Zoom, Right, it's, it's almost like I feel like at this point in time, I feel, I think that at this point in time, if we re, if we brought out the Urban Dictionary, our social connection would be Zoom, right? It doesn't have to be that way. So linking arms together, I think we need to be able to tolerate that we've got to say some of this stuff. We've actually got to say things like this feels scary or this is frightening. Um, yeah, I do worry if COVID-19 can live on my hair. Uh, and not feel ashamed that, you know, we're going and, and, and searching for these things because this is the common human experience at the moment. We, we don't have information. We don't know how long this is going to go for. So we want to be able to connect with one another at the level of not saying, well, go exercise, go sleep and eat well, uh, but be able to say, you know, this is a moment in history where nobody has the scripts. What's it been like for you? We went to the shops yesterday to pick up, what did we go for? We needed to go to the post office because we've moved house and because of COVID-19, um, I haven't been able to do the change of address thing. Uh, so we needed to go and do that. And, um, and we were like pleasantly surprised. Dimmicks was open. We're like, oh, let's just pop in. And there was this, so shout out to Dimmicks of Macquarie Centre. If you were the young gentleman there, 
And I, you know, we kind of, I watched for a little while because I was waiting for like the opening for the physical distance, right? Like mm. there again, I probably will never be able to go a shot for a while without thinking of physical distance. Like I keep thinking like there's a pool noodle going out of my head and that's how far I have to be. And um, this gentleman, every customer, he just said, and how are you coping with all of this? Wow. Right. And this is not, you know, your usual checkout experience. How are you? And then you have to think, do I ask them back the same thing? Like, do they actually really want to tell me how they are? You know, he was genuinely asking each person, and how are you coping in these days? And as I listened to the conversation, um, it was genuine. Uh, customer would say, yeah, it looks a bit hit and miss. Um, you know, we're living paycheck to paycheck or whatever. And, and he would be like, yeah, man, that is really, really tough. You know, I'm, I, I hope that you will, you will have a great day today. And, um, and, you know, I was a little like, okay, this is the drill, right? This is the drill with the Dimix guy. He is going to ask me, and how are you going today? And, and like, what do I do? <laughs> will I actually spill my guts? I have no idea. Right. So came to my turn and this genuine gentleman said and 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 how are you doing today and guess what there i am spilling my guts i didn't plan to do it but it all came out <laughs> what is that about i think that's about a genuine thing of us needing to acknowledge that there are stuff this there's conversations that we can have with one another that can actually say that <clears throat> this sucks this isn't great it's not a great time so social connection and 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 feeling like you're a part of a community is really um quite essential right now i think what's really important for me to say too right now is um we need to pace down right pace down i know that a bunch of us are juggling um the schooling from home and you know the all of it it's okay to pace down and to say that you're not going to be able to do all of it. Because if you think about what I just said, with natural disasters, et cetera, it is an event. And then there's a bit of a timeline that you can project your, you know, your sustainability of what you're going to do. We don't have that right now. We don't know what the timeline is. And, you, and we could really all pace up and then just burn ourselves out in the process. Um, what's your expectations of trying to find meaning during this time? You know, I, I don't want to say that it's about learning a new language and getting a degree right now. I don't think that is the point of it. Um, I think the point of it is actually saying, what is it that I'm super grateful for right now? Um, gosh, I'd really love, I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity right now to stop and invest in that. And that's okay right if if what we have right now is the simple joy and pleasure of our garden and we want to spend a couple of hours in it we don't have to feel guilty that that's frivolous uh because you know that's giving us a sense of joy and a sense of reality that yeah the, the, this is this is the new day um if for you it's only being it's, it's not only it's being able to hold your child's attention uh with their school you know for an hour today okay all right um you might find that you hold their attention or they hold their attention a little bit more in the days to come you know head for the things that you can pace down and invest in the things that give you a sense of um hope uh joy camaraderies, uh, com camaraderie, like we're doing it together, because for now, we don't have enough markers to help us to know how long this is going to go for. And that is part of the uncertainty that we are living with. And it's part of, and one part of the real difference, as well as to some of the other events that have happened. So yeah, okay, well, maybe with SARS, you can say it's the same thing. But the thing about SARS is it, it didn't it didn't bring about a global shutdown, a collapse of industries and economies across the globe. Um, and without realizing it, we are projecting our anxieties into that we, we are worried we, it's like we don't know what the what the new world is going to be is going to look like. And, and we're holding all this stuff, right? And so it is a little bit different, I think. I could be wrong, but I'm happy to dialogue with you um, as, as you're thinking and listening about this as well. 
don't forget the children. Please don't forget the children. At this point in time, they're making memories. They're actually making meaning. So when we actually look at children's memories, children don't necessarily remember the event blow by blow. They remember the interpretation of the event. That's what gets encoded in their memories. So, you know, um, remember that the world right now um, looks like, um, you know, what's the one movie in my childhood that scared me? Jaws. Uh, I, I, till today, I, I just can't watch it. I cannot watch it. And, and it was largely because we, when I was a kid, I didn't watch Jaws. How I got to watch Jaws was I went to visit someone and the TV was on and like you had no choice but to sit there while Jaws was playing, <laughs> right? And that is my encoded memory of Jaws, being helpless and trapped because I couldn't be rude and go somewhere else and where would you go? You know, someone else's house, right? While Jaws is playing in the background, <laughs> Um, even till today, Jaws is like the worst thing. I, I won't watch it. So kids are making interpretations of their memories, right? And so it's okay to pull back, hang back, be in your pajamas, don't brush your teeth, eat popcorn and chocolate. It's all right. Don't blame yourself. It's going to be all right. It's going to be good people. At the end of the day, this will finish. This will finish. All righty. That's all I have to say. Catch you later. <laughs>